Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, preparing society and meeting the needs of an aging population. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have on the podcast today? Today, we are honored to be joined by Laura Mosqueda, who is Professor of Family Medicine and Geriatrics and Dean of the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California and Director of the National Center of Elder Abuse. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I don't think we've had a dean on before, Alex. This is our first dean. We're moving up. (laughs) Be gentle. (laughs) <laughs> well, we're going to be talking about um, elder abuse and neglect um, and mistreatment and figuring out what all those different words mean. But before we get into this topic, uh, Laura, do you have a song request for Alex? Yes, I'd like for you to play Veronica by Elvis Costello. And can you tell us why? Oh, uh, uh, once people hear the lyrics, they'll know. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have to say, I love this album, the Spike album. I love this song. But I didn't actually know what the lyrics were until I looked them up because I have a hard time understanding Elvis Costello, particularly when he gets to the chorus of these songs. Um, When when you see his video, you get it. Yes, yes. This is about his grandmother who had Alzheimer's. Yep. And um, some of the lyrics are about um, abuse. And I'll try to sing them more clearly than Elvis does. pretty little head of yours what goes on in that place in the dark well i used to know a girl and i would have sworn that her name was veronica well she used to have a carefree mind of her own and a delicate look in her eye these days i'm afraid she's not even sure if her name is veronica Do you suppose that waiting, hands on eyes, Veronica has gone to hide? And all the time she laughs at those who shout her name and steal her clothes. Veronica. Veronica. We'll get a little bit more of that, too, at the end of this podcast, because I kind of want to hear more of the lyrics. You know, uh, before we get into the meat of the discussion, um, just want to also acknowledge we are still in the middle of a pandemic. We are kind of waking up as a nation to some of the uh, systemic in- injustices that we have as a nation and how it impacts minority populations, including blacks. Protests going on today is... We're recording this on um, June 5th. Um, Laura, um, can you just give us kind of a brief, how are things going in L.A. right now? Yeah, well, they've been pretty wild here in L.A. And, and one, of the, one of the nice things about being the dean of a medical school is I'm able to say things like Black Lives Matter and that racism is a public health crisis. Um, and I'm able to work with people so that we can do something about it. Um, so that's what we're setting about doing. This morning um, at 10 a.m., I was outside with a large group of students um, and, um, and fellow clinicians uh, and researchers and, um, and had our eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence um, in honor of, of uh, George Floyd's memory. Um, and um, so it's had a, had a big impact on us here. And it's really inspired and motivated us to, to do something, not just a Band-Aid, um, but something at a really systemic level, in addition to the little things that we can do starting tomorrow. Do you have a sense what those changes might be? Yeah, we're looking at a number of things right now, Alex. Um, so we're starting with educating ourselves. I'm starting by listening. I've got to listen to uh, particularly um, some of my Black colleagues, students, residents, practicing physicians and hear more about their experiences. I spent about an hour and a half doing that last night on a large Zoom call. And it was extraordinary to understand what people have been through and have not been allowed to express or have been afraid to express or haven't been welcome to express it. 
So I think listening and learning from people is really, really key right now. And then there's lots of things we can do. So we're talking about new courses. Um, we've already, we fortunately, about 18 months ago, I started an office on social justice and appointed an associate dean for social justice at the school. And so we have the infrastructure in place to really run with this. I think one of the things uh, is our tendency to do, you know, particularly as physicians, is, oh, we want to do something. Like, something's wrong. Let's do something about it. Yeah. And, um, and I think one of the important things to do right now is to, for me, is to shut up and listen um, and, um, and, and understand what it is we can do together um, across the university, across, certainly across the School of Medicine, but across the university and with our community um, that will make a, a longstanding substantial change in people's lives. And can I also ask, um, right now in LA, how are things going with COVID? Well, um, uh, things are ramping back up with COVID. So we had, we had a, what seemed like a, a bit of a surge. I know people keep talking about peaks, and I keep talking about rolling hills. Um, and so we have these rolling hills, but we are pretty concerned now that COVID seems that the numbers just in the past few days are coming back up particularly over at our county hospital. So our faculty worked in the, our private hospital, Keck Hospital and in Verdugo Hills and our Norris Cancer Hospital. Uh, but we also um, provide a lot of the staffing for our county general hospital, uh, the LAC USC hospital. And we're really seeing an uptick there that has us pretty concerned. And now with, uh, uh, with the protests, um, we're concerned about people's exposure because a lot of people, you know, it's they're pretty close together and they're not wearing masks and uh, we're worried it's going to go up. And then um, the other thing, if you want, we can talk about is the effect of COVID on older adults, particularly those in nursing homes. Yeah. And I think that would be great. Um, we've had several podcasts on, I think this is, we were probably around 18 or 20 podcasts on COVID. We've done several on uh, its effect on older adults, nursing homes. Um, I wonder, you are also, I mean, you are a national expert on uh, older adults, elder abuse, mistreatment. Is there an impact at all on COVID and um, what we're seeing in that regard? I'm sure there is because it only makes sense and we could talk about why it only makes sense. But the sad reality is we have no good centralized mechanism for getting a handle on how much elder abuse is out there, which means we don't have a really good way to measure what kind of increase there's, there has been. I'll tell you one thing that really, really scares me, because I'm also a volunteer long-term care ombudsman, is um, we have not been allowed to go into nursing homes. Ombudsmen have not been allowed to go into nursing homes, so we don't know what the heck's going on. Really? You can't, you can't go in? I feel ombudsman. like healthcare providers can go in, but ombudsmen can't? <laughs> yeah, the ombudsmen have not been allowed. So I've just been working with um, the head of our long-term care ombudsman, uh, here in Los Angeles County um, to talk about what kinds of uh, PPE, et cetera, can at least a paid ombudsman yeah. utilize to go back into yeah. in the nursing homes. You know, it just reminds me too, uh, maybe taking a big step back and talking about definitions, because um, I don't think I learned what an ombudsman was, like well into geriatrics fellowship. Can, can you first describe what that is and then we can describe like what elder abuse and neglect and all these other terms is? That'd be great. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I would, I'd be happy to do that. So the long-term care ombudsman is a very specific type of ombudsman who, who go into nursing homes and really serve as um, advocates for people who live in nursing homes. Because as probably most everybody listening to this podcast is aware, a lot of people in nursing homes are pretty... Um, physically and or cognitively disabled, and it's often a combination of both. Um, they may or may not have family members who can advocate for them or who know how to advocate for them. Um, and so, you know, the ombudsman, the long-term care ombudsman is a person who goes in, we get training in rules and regulations. So we can, we can go into a nursing home and we look at like, do they have the right signs posted? Is it clear where people can go for a variety of activities? But then it's also a matter of saying, well, it's nice that it's posted, but is it really happening? And then we also just go bedside one-on-one -on -one, um, with the residents, the people who live there, and kind of check in and see how they're doing. So it's a combination. It's woefully underfunded. I know that's probably a common theme as well uh, for a variety of things. Um, 
So the paid ombudsmen rely on volunteer long-term care ombudsmen to help them go into nursing homes and, and kind of monitor how things are going. And correct me, when, when there are issues around elder abuse or neglect in nursing facilities, the long-term care ombudsman is the person uh, that it goes to instead of adult protective services? Right. So when, um, when there's a suspected case of abuse or neglect in a licensed facility, it goes through the um, ombudsman process. Outside of a, of a licensed facility, it goes through adult protective services. When I talk about elder abuse, should I be saying mistreatment? Like what's the current, like what's the right thing to be saying here? And why do people use all these different terms? We do it to confuse you. Has it worked? <laughs> it's worked. Wonderfully. Hey, it doesn't fantastic. take much to confuse me. So there's that. So it, it has been kind of ridiculously confusing, right? So uh, let me just talk to you a little bit about the pros and cons. And, and I'll just put on research hack for a minute and say that um, what happened is there was a National Academies panel that met probably a bazillion years ago at this point that tried to narrow the term and talked about it, it narrowed it down to elder mistreatment, which means that it's either abuse or neglect happening by a trusted other. And the reason the trusted other piece was put in was because um, if you're an older, if you're a really healthy 65 year old walking down the street and somebody comes and robs you at gunpoint, is that elder abuse or is it like a kind of your run of the mill crime type of deal? And the argument was, well, that's not a trusted other. So that's really not what we're trying to get at here. What we're trying to get at is when there's a relationship um, and, um, or a reasonable expectation um, of, tr of a trusting relationship. So, and that was really for research purposes because we were all over the map doing research. I mean, everybody had their own definition and you could never, and then people would try and do a meta-analysis and, and combine data. It was just crazy. It still is crazy, but it's just a little less crazy now. So when you're doing, when I'm, when I'm doing, wearing my research hat, I talk about elder mistreatment and there has to be a trusted other. And I, I go back to that kind of core definition. When I'm being a clinician, I don't care. I mean, the point is, right, is this person being abused or neglected? You can call it elder abuse. You can call it elder mistreatment. But the reality is if I have a reasonable suspicion, I'm required to make, to make a report. And part of the reason people got away from the word abuse is because it's, you know, it's a scary term and, it's, there's, and there's a lot of emotion that goes along with it too. And um, so sometimes even as clinicians, we're afraid to call it elder abuse. Yeah. And I also get confused too. So when we think about neglect, I always, I was, like when we talk about elder abuse, I hear how common neglect is as a cause for elder abuse or a reason for, um, but then I also hear abuse and neglect. So is neglect part of abuse or is abuse different than neglect? How it, it, I, For me, it's all part and parcel, the same thing. Um, but at some point, like... I'll just go with the flow on that. And if people okay. want to say abuse and neglect, that's, that's you know, mazel tov, that's fine. And that way, at least you're clear. Because sometimes people think of abuse as the act of, I mean, the difference is it sort of can be active and passive, right? So abuse is doing something to somebody, hitting somebody, yeah. yelling at somebody, um, drugging somebody. And neglect is, is sort of that more passive of, uh, not doing something that gets somebody into trouble. So it's reasonable to talk about abuse and neglect from that aspect of actively doing something and then actively not doing something. And how big of an issue is this? It's pretty big. Uh, and um, it's estimated that one in 10 older adults um, are abused. And that's a lot of people. Um, you know, one thing that that's that can be difficult when you're using words like abuse and neglect is sometimes as a, you know, as a clinician, I'm like, well, he's getting abused, but they don't mean it. They don't know, you know, like this, the, they're doing the best they can. And, um, and we're trying to get people past that idea because even if it is a caregiver, a loved one doing the best they can, the reality for that older adult is they're still getting abused or neglected. And, mm -hmm. and it really is a big issue. So one in 10 is huge. And, the other thing I would mention is it's even bigger for people with dementia. So it's estimated that uh, um, about 50%, so one in two people with dementia will get abused or neglected at some point during their um, wow. during their course. So it's wow. gigantic. 
And does it does it vary on the type of abuse? Is it like mostly financial abuse and neglect, or is there like yeah. psychological and sexual abuse and all those other like? And does it depend on dementia versus not dementia? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, dissect through that a little bit. Um, so this is this is now just my personal anecdotal observation, and I I fully understand that the plural of anecdote is not data, so I'm not trying to go there. Uh, <laughs> But I will say my observation is that if you look at the stages of dementia, there's a certain correlation with types of abuse. So early stages of dementia, a little more subtle, the person's kind of confused, people do a lot of financial abuse. Then um, middle stages where you have people who may be having behavioral disturbances, um, this is when we're tending to see people getting physical hitting and, and physical abuse. Then the late stages when you become very dependent for feeding and grooming and hygiene is when we tend to see neglect. Um, so that's been my, my observation uh, mm -hmm. related to types of abuse and stages of dementia. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, clearly financial abuse and emotional abuse are, are two huge types of abuse um, if you look at the general older adult population. Um, sexual abuse occurs as well. Um, um, it's more hidden and... Um, we don't know how prevalent it is in nursing homes. It's probably small, but it's still pretty awful. Well, so when the 75-year-old protester was hit by police and, uh, and then was sent... You mean to, tripped, Alex? Right, tripped, <laughs> according to police. When he, was, when he was knocked to the ground and then ended up in a uh, hospital in critical condition, uh, are those police the trusted other? I would argue that they are. And the reason, the reason I threw in that tripped thing is because initially, at least that's the report I heard, is the police said he tripped, mm -hmm. right? Then you look at the video and you're yeah. like, well, if you consider getting shoved in the chest and pushing you backward, tripping, okay. This is really important because this happens all the time when we're trying to figure out. The other thing is hard to figure out, abuse and neglect, right? Older adults have all sorts of physiologic changes that A, make you more susceptible to abuse and neglect, and B, um, can also mask and mimic signs of abuse and neglect. So look, you know, the same shove to a healthy 35-year-old may be annoying, but to a 75-year-old with Parkinson's disease, that can become deadly. And right. so it's the same act depending on, on who it's performed on can be abusive or non-abusive. Mm -hmm. And are the laws equally applied, whether this is battery um, from a stranger or abuse um, from a trusted other? Well, I don't, I don't actually know. It depends on, so every state has different laws. Mm -hmm. Different states have different, and, and when they talk about elder abuse laws, they define elder differently. Uh -huh. 58, 60, 65. Mm -hmm. Some just say don't have an age-based criterion, but talk about kind of functional level. Mm -hmm. um, and then they also have different kinds of abuse that are reported and defined. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, which is another thing that makes research really hard because you have this, you know, huge gamish of, of different definitions and criteria as well. So mm -hmm. you can't even compare across states. Heck, even when you're in a state with the same laws, you can't appear can't really compare across counties. There's so much variability in terms of how things are applied. Mm -hmm. That was a uh, long way to not answer your question. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, you know, if you look at, you know, I Googled Scholar, <laughs> elder abuse and neglect before we talked. And if you look at Google Scholar, then it seems like this really wasn't an issue before the 1990s. Um, but you've been one of the people who helped put this on the map and show that, no, this is a big issue. Why is it taking so long to go come to light and, you know, have attention on it, because of course it's been going on for so long. Yeah. Until you call it out, right. You don't, you don't know about it. And, and uh, I give Artstone Foundation a lot of credit for this. I mean, they, they were, they were the foundation in the nineties who grabbed onto this and maybe even earlier and said, this is a problem. And they were one of the few funding it in, in funding it in a really serious way. And, you know, once you put a name on it, it's, it's like what we've seen in, in other areas, right, related to social justice issues, too. Once you name it, people can then um, identify with it and say, yeah, that's what that was. That wasn't just, oh, she was frustrated, so she finally hit her mom, and 
and now we can ignore it. Now we have a name for it. And, and, and we have the ability to say, that's not okay. Can't do that. Yeah. And then once you're able to do that, you start saying, okay, well, how do we understand this and study it? Mm-hmm. And when, speaking of studying it, we don't want to get too researchy here, but in broad brushstrokes, what are the current um, hot research topics in terms of elder mistreatment? Oh, I, I'd say they're in a few different areas. So some just has to do with basic mechanisms, um, what we call forensic markers. So, hey, older, adult, older adults bruise easily. They just, they do. We know that, right? Cap, capillaries become more fragile. You might be on an aspirin or you might be on on something more, uh, right? For if you have atrial fibrillation, whatever. Um, you may have been on steroids, so, so you have a lot of, of thinning of the epidermis. So yeah, older adults bruise more easily. So how do you tell when it's due to abuse? So you got you to gotta study it and, and figure that out. So um, we've done some studies on bruising. There's great work being done by colleagues at Cornell that look looking at fractures and fracture patterns. Because again, if somebody falls and breaks a hip, by the time I look at, they're an old person with dementia and they've got a broken hip, I don't know if anybody shoved them. So is there any difference when we look at fracture patterns? Uh, and, and so the jury's still out, but I think some of these forensic markers that will help us as clinicians not overly accept every injury we see and recognize that some of them may be due to abuse or neglect. How do you know if a pressure sore was due to abuse and neglect as an example? And if, if you want, we can talk in more detail about that. So, so that's one area. I think another area that's fascinating has to do with understanding basic changes in an aging brain, even without dementia, and why older adults are more susceptible to financial abuse, to scams and frauds, even if they test out normal cognitively. So that's a really fascinating area that's getting pursued as well. Mm. Um, We're also beginning, finally, I think, to look at some intervention studies um, because we don't know what works. Um, like we've thrown all kinds of stuff. And and I think you look at other movements like related to um, battered women, and you see that with the very best of intentions, interventions were applied, but once they were studied, found to be maybe not so helpful. So we really have to study our interventions like forensic centers. It's, so um, I was actually just reading. So um, Alex was doing PubMed searches. I was reading the Artstone Foundation Elder Abuse and Neglect Initiative Legacy Report. And um, really encouraged. We'll have a link to it for our, uh, our listeners on our website. But um, a fair amount of talking about forensic centers. And when I hear forensic centers, I think like CSI and... <laughs> you're like analyzing blood splat patterns on yeah. the walls. Uh, is that what you're doing in forensic centers? Um, wh- what is that? No, that's exactly what we're doing. No. Uh, <laughs> so what happened is, um, and this is my fault, I came up with the name Elder Abuse Forensic Center like, before any of those things. Before CSI. Believe it, or dun, not, dun. believe it or not, you young people listening, there was a time before CSI and all this other stuff. So this was this was back in the back in the day. Uh, before any of those things existed. And really, um, if you look at forensics, it has to do with the intersection of law and and medicine. And what we were seeing, uh, and this was through some early Archstone funded grants, is um, we started some multidisciplinary teams. And what I was seeing is that um, we could get together with Adult Protective Services and provide some geriatric expertise and I might go on a house call with APS and see somebody who was all bruised up and I would go, wow, somebody beat this person. And, uh, and then we found it incredibly difficult to get the attention of the other systems that needed to be involved, like criminal justice system. And we realized we all needed to really come to the table and talk. And so the idea behind the forensic center was kind of like a multidisciplinary team on steroids. And sometimes now they're called enhanced multidisciplinary teams. Um, you get all the right people at the table at the same time to talk about those three super complicated cases. And we found, hey, more efficient, more effective, taking care of people more quickly. There were times when I would go on a house call with an APS social worker, a a police officer, and uh, somebody, depending on, on what state you're in, who could help with guardianship issues. So that we would go out there as a group I would want the police officer there because it may have been unsafe or difficult to get in. Uh, and then we were safe getting in. We could see the situation. I could do a capacity assessment sometimes, especially when it was 
dramatic, which it often was in terms of lack of capacity, and we could get get the person into a safer, what we, per, and I want to be careful about this, what we perceive to be a safer environment. Th- these were things that would have taken like four months to try and get everybody together in the past. But once we started the forensic centers, get everybody at the table talking and trying to help people more quickly. The other thing that was really important is we, we really educated each other. Um, so I talk about the early days where the Tower of Babel a little bit um, because, you know, one person would call the older adult a patient. Somebody would call them a victim. Somebody would call them a client. We were all talking about the same person. Right. Uh, but we had to learn each other's language and we had to learn, <laughs> and I'm mostly talking about myself here, not to be accusatory. Like, what do you mean you can't go in and help? And, and um, so we had a lot of vigorous conversations, but we ended up teaching each other a lot too that I think helps us serve the older adults in our community better too. And how do people get into, the, like, who do these forensic centers see? Well, so the client, the, the, way, the way we set these up um, in the early days, um, and again, this was entirely through the Archstone Foundation. And in fact, one thing that I think was, was really, a, a, it's just still a memory seared in my brain, was um, this needed to be something that we were doing with the community. At that time, I was at University of California, Irvine. We were in Orange County, California. And we wanted to get this going. And Archstone said, we will help fund this. They had funded some of our early work when we implanted a, a geriatrician and a geropsychologist to work with APS, and we knew we wanted to expand. They actually, Mary Ellen Coleman from the Archstone Foundation came with me to a meeting with the community and said, we are really interested in this. Tell us, tell us county official people, what are your, what's your contribution going to be to this? And it was just magic. It was a great a great opportunity where everything was getting leveraged from the university, from the community, from the foundation to, to really get us uh, up and running. I've always been interested in the ethical issues that sort of are at the core of, of uh, particularly self-neglect. Um, and thinking about, you know, you mentioned the word safety in a more safe environment and, you know, wanted to be careful around the words there because that is one of the central tensions, isn't it? In this country, we allow people to take enormous risks to their own life. Yes. Um, you know, we value, you know, it's, there's a norm around this. You know, the major rock climbing magazine has an obituary section, right? So we allow people to take tremendous risks. Um, how is that different when a person turns 65? It's not. It just isn't. It isn't different when a person turns 65, and, and it shouldn't be. What, what begins to happen, though, um, and, and you're exactly right in terms of the ethical boundaries here, everybody's allowed to make a bad decision. We do it all the time. Um, but at what point do we say you're not allowed to make a bad decision? And that tends to be when somebody, for example, um, has a dementing illness and is signing away things that just isn't in keeping with anything related to their prior history and values. It's what we see when, um, you know, an 85-year-old man is courted by a 23-year-old woman. And I understand true love can happen under those circumstances. I just think it's more unusual when he has moderately advanced dementia, is very, very wealthy, and his bank account starts getting drained. So, but that's Mm -hmm. the argument that gets made. You know what? He's happy. Like, what... Who are you to say that his children should should get his fortune? And those are the those are the difficult conversations we have to have. Yeah, I, you know the other thing that struck me about this issue is, as dean of the medical school, I'm sure you see this. So much medical training these days occurs in hospitals, and so people are used to seeing older adults in this very protected environment, and then when they go into per- patients' homes, they have a very low threshold to say. They cannot live here like this. There is no way, absolutely. They need to be hospitalized. They need to be in a nursing home. And yet, you know, as, you know, geriatrics, palliative care, and people who work in outpatient medicine, we see people make it under very difficult circumstances with some support in the home. I wonder if you could comment on that, that issue. Yeah, and, and just to get to the research piece for a minute, a guy named David Burns is doing really interesting work in this area with something called goal attainment scaling, which is based on, like, how do we know if it's a good outcome? 
right? I know if it's a good outcome. I, I got this older adult out of that nasty situation and now he's safe in a nursing home. Well, hello. Like, this is the one thing this guy never wanted. He would rather be at home and get mm-hmm. abused to the degree he was getting abused than be in a nursing home. That's not a good outcome from his perspective. Mm-hmm. So um, these are the things that we were really grappling with, especially in the early days of our Elder Abuse Forensic Center, which is what is it that makes a good outcome and, and how do we measure that? Um, and you're, you're right. It has to be as, as patient-centered or person-centered as possible so that they're defining what the good outcome is mm-hmm. um, for themselves. And really, our job is to try and help get that. And I would argue that sometimes the best thing we can do is mitigate the abuse that's going on. Just make it better. And we, we can't get, a, get away from it entirely, but we can make it a lot, a lot better Um, And there's a whole variety of ways we've done that through our forensic center teams. But the person stays where they want to be, you know, and the one person they still recognize and love is the person who's abusing them. So what can we do in that situation that still respects the autonomy to the maximum that we can for the older adult? Yeah, I feel like for especially when we're also dealing with like in the hospital residents and attendings, like somebody could be very marginal at home. And like, they're going to, they're going to be marginal. They're going to, you know, you know, sink or swim. Um, But in the hospital, like we will not discharge them because we're worried so much about their safety and what's going to happen. We have many people in many hospitals who are, who are there for an extended period of time. Yeah. How how should we also be thinking about that? Any words of wisdom? No. No. (laughs) <laughs> uh, uh, yeah so i mean hospitals just love this right uh, because it's non-reimbursed time and drgs are blown, you know getting blown up and all that and so i think this is where if there is a forensic center or an enhanced mbt in your area it's really helpful because you can look at at, at a reasonably safe discharge and recognizing that none of us are really completely safe anyway yeah um, but you don't want to be sending back somebody back to a really horrible situation. Although we do it all the time with nursing homes, I will say people come in with awful pressure sores, uh, you know, that, and we send them back there. The other thing though, and this, believe it or not, relates back to COVID is we're doing so much telehealth now that we're actually able to um, see into people's homes. Yeah. For the first time. Right. Yeah. Wow. Who would have thunk it? Yeah. So, so, um, so I think we really should be utilizing, um, you know, the, the telehealth tools now to get a sense of what the home environment is like too. So I'm also guessing that to get into like a forensic center, you actually have to have providers, banks, social workers identify that elder abuse is happening and potentially screening for it. Is there a tool that we should be using for screening? Is there any evidence um, for that? And how should we be thinking about this when we're seeing older adults? Or should we just be waiting for them to tell us, hey, I'm being abused? Yeah, um, yeah, that would be a long wait. Uh, and, and, and you would miss it. Um, so that's, that's um, but we don't have any good data to say, this is what you need to use. So I'll tell you just as a clinician, I generally ask people three questions. Are you afraid of anybody? Is anybody hurting you? And is anybody taking your money without your permission? Um, And that's, for me, standard practice. I don't have an evidence base for saying it, but I do have some common sense, right? There's that famous idea of we didn't need a randomized controlled trial to tell us that parachutes are necessary. And so it's not not quite that far, but um, but to me... I'm, I'm willing to go with that um, in, in, uh, without data to say these are the questions I need to be asking. There are screening tools. Um, uh, Terry Fulmer, who's now CEO of the John A. Hartford Foundation, um, um, published one of the really important ones um, that, that are used, but, but, but they're still not being used clinically as much. We're now um, adapting those, uh, some of the tools that she developed uh, for screening in emergency rooms. There's lots of good work being done in this in this area. The other thing is uh, we publish uh, um, a model called AIM, the Abuse Intervention Prevention Model, AIM. And I just carry it around in my head. And it's being, being that I'm simple-minded has been very helpful with all this because uh, it's pretty simple. It's There are three kind of buckets that we think about or three domains that we think about related to elder abuse. The older adult, 
the trusted other in the context of their situation. So there's you know, reasonable data to show that older adults with dementia, particularly dementia with behavioral disturbance, are more likely to get abused or neglected. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that if you're a trusted other with a mental health problem, uh, um, you're more likely to be abusive. We have contextual, uh, you know, something about context where social isolation uh, seems to increase risk, financial dependency. So I just carry that model around in my head and I'll see somebody in my practice. Uh, do we have time for a quick anecdote? Uh, yeah, please. Okay. okay. So here's my quick anecdote, which is uh, uh, we were seeing somebody who came through through our, our clinical program who we were di- diagnosed with. Alzheimer's disease and uh, had a family conference, you know, it was all kind of geriatric kumbaya stuff, right? We're pulling people together. This is what we think. This is why we think it. Um, it's really not, you know, it doesn't look safe for mom to stay at home on her own because she was, she had a gas range and a newspaper caught on fire. And so there were some real dangers there. Family was like, this is, you know, we understand it. And uh, we were anticipating this. So we have ex-daughter who we think can move in with mom. Um, so it's, it's all sounding good. And it, then you ask the question, well, um, why is she available? Um, and you do ask a few more questions and dig under the layers. And it turns out that this daughter um, has schizophrenia, which is con- controlled right now, uh, but much of the time is not controlled. And so we would have a woman with dementia who is having behavioral disturbance being cared for by somebody with schizophrenia who, who is not under good control most of the time in a very isolated situation, you know, you can, you can see abuse coming, uh, right? So that's an opportunity to, as a clinician, say, okay, you can apply the AIM model and say that's probably not a good situation. What, can we, what should we do about it? Mm-hmm. Which brings us to... What should our listeners who are overwhelmingly clinicians, what should they be doing? What can we be doing as clinicians caring for older adults in a variety of settings? Right. So, so I would ask those three questions. Um, are you afraid of anybody? Um, is anybody hurting you? And is anybody taking your money with you, without your permission? The other thing I would do is like what we're really good at doing and when we're taking care of older adults, which is, which is just asking a question and stepping back and listening so um, I will say I used to, I, I loved my grandparents as many geriatricians uh, had close relationships with grandparents. And so early in my career, whenever uh, a patient would say, my grandson's moving in with me, I would always go, that is so sweet. And they would always go, yes, it's lovely. Uh, but now that I became a cynical elder abuse researcher, I, I just say, oh, your grandson's moving in with you. What do you think about that? And now I hear things like, well, I'm kind of worried because he just got out of prison. Never heard that when I was just telling people how sweet. So I think, I think we need to ask about these things and we need to ask about prior relationships so that what the living situation is like and not just assume it's nice because you're with family, but clinicians asking about what it's like at home, what the relationships are like, I think is very important. Looking at the body language, not only of the older adult, but the but the caregiver or family member who comes with them? Are they in the corner of the office with their arms crossed, kind of glaring at the older adult? Are they constantly correcting them right in front of you? Um, Being good observers and listeners, I think, um, can help us prevent and can help us pick it up at early stages because the sad reality is by the time it gets to APS, it's usually been going on for months or even years. And if you could wave a magic wand and change the system in some way, um, how would you change it? Would you give APS uh, workers more authority to go into patients' homes? Would you create a national registry um, around elder mistreatment? What, what would you do to move the system forward on a policy level? I think the, the most important thing is that we need to have structures available to support aging well. So the more people who age in a healthy way, the less vulnerable or susceptible they are to abuse or neglect. The other thing is the more structures we have in place, social structures, adult daycare programs, social services, food programs, et cetera, that's what we really need to to concentrate on. 
I love my colleagues in APS, but there's not one shred of evidence that APS helps. So I'm not, I'm not sure that that's the right way to go. It might be. Let's study it. Um, but I, I think a lot of it has to do with social structure and support for older adults and for caregivers. Yeah. You know, one of the common frustrations physicians and nurse practitioners have around APS is uh, they give a lot of information to APS, but they don't get any information back. And we hear that's because, you know, they can't give information back, but it definitely doesn't seem like a team collaborative effort um, because it's important for us to know kind of, wait, what are you doing? Because we need to know this information too. Yeah. It feels like a black hole, uh, you know, light comes in, but doesn't come out. And, um, and that is a frustration. Now, see, you're making me feel guilty like I never worked on. It's something I completely agree with, and it's something we should work on. That's a, that should be an easy policy. And, and I don't even know for sure that it is a policy. Uh, oh. <laughs> but we've been told it so many times, we all believe it. I, yeah, I believe it. Um, you know, because it would be a hassle, right? And what, inf- what information is private? Like, I'm going, at least tell me that you went out there and saw them. Like, I don't need for you to tell me details, but I think a lot of us clinicians just want some feedback that you went there and you saw them or you tried to go there and you didn't see them. And and we don't even, we don't, for the most part, we don't even get that. There are some exceptions. There are some APSs around the country that, that, um, that do that, but I would say they're not common. The last question for me is, so when you're talking about um, uh, supports that we're providing older adults, um, it just, I mean, we've had a lot of discussions in recent podcasts about disparities in care um, and in the supports that we actually offer. Um, How does this impact uh, minority populations and is it any different than non-minority populations? Yeah. Um, So I can't quote you articles on this, but yeah, I mean, it has to be, right? So we, we know now about the stresses uh, and um, in living situations and how that impacts health and well-being. You know, I can have an 85-year-old patient and I can tell her to get out and exercise more, but if she lives in a dangerous neighborhood and she's afraid to go out, um, she's not going to be able to exercise, right? So she becomes more frail and, and becomes more vulnerable to abuse and neglect as well. Um, and I think the other thing is that... Um, Family dynamics matter as well. So understanding cultural norms is really important too. You know, in some families, it's considered normal and good to for everybody to keep living together. And in some cultures, it's not. So we have to understand the cultural issues that come up as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, last question for me. I wrote a paper about elder self-neglect with Bernie Lowe and Louise Aronson. And we talked about creative ways that um, people can care for older adults and provide support in the home. One of the issues that frequently comes up is they won't let me in. You know, they won't let in the support that we're talking about here that to, to help people live at home where they want to be. Um, any creative tips or tricks that you have to get that needed support in the home to support the caregivers, to support the patients who want to be at home? Yeah, I mean, I think we just do our best. We take a person-centered approach to understand to the very best of our ability what the issues are. Um, if it's somebody who is, you know, has, has an illness that, such as Alzheimer's and there's no, there's no way to, to be rational and have a rational conversation or nothing will stick, right? Because you have a conversation and they agree, but t- 10 minutes later that's gone. Um, there's, there's not a lot you can do. So we, you know, I think we talk about watchful waiting. Um, and sometimes I'll work with, with my families and say, there's just nothing more we can do right now because pulling your dad out of his home, even though we know it's not safe, would be so traumatic for him. We all agree it's not worth it. And what I'll say is we just need to prepare for the crisis. And I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be something. It could be a fall. It could be a fire, you know, it could be something. And so sometimes I just get super pragmatic and say, let's just, let's just have a game plan for when something bad happens, because we know there's a pretty high likelihood. Mm -hmm. And some of this is about harm reduction, maybe taking the knobs off the stove. Absolutely. Um, You know, one of the reviewers on that piece said, 
you know, talking about like the chagrin factor, like you don't want to wait until you're sifting through the charred remains of the house and finding the bones of your patient. And it's right. not just the patient's home. They may live in an apartment with, you know, family next door. You're putting others at risk. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's another important piece of it is, does it put other people at risk? Mm-hmm. And that, that also then becomes a line or not a bright line, a fuzzy line, but it does become yeah. a line that, that we have to talk to families about when other people are at risk. Well, Laura, is there anything else that you'd like to say to our listeners in the last couple minutes of this podcast? Uh, no, it's been a pleasure, pleasure to, to, uh, to talk to both of you. I really enjoyed it. And, um, and I would like for anybody out there who's involved with geriatric fellows to consider, um, having um, all fellows um, have the experience of becoming volunteer long-term care ombudsman for a year or two, um, because it's a wonderful learning experience um, that that I think we would all carry with us. Yeah. Our fellows also go to the forensic center and encourage like everybody else uh, to to see that too. With that, I really want to thank you Um, real quickly, because I think it was really important. The three questions again, why is this night? Oh, no, that's something else. Um, uh, is, is anybody hurting you? Are you afraid of anybody? And is anybody using your money without your permission? That's going to be my main learning point. Um, I'm going to remember those three questions. Last you thing. almost got the Hanukkah questions there, though. Yeah. <laughs> Alex, you want to add this with a little bit more? A little of bit Veronica. more Veronica. Here we go. sits in her favorite chair she sits very quiet and still and they call her a name that they never get right and if they don't then nobody else will but she used to have a carefree mind of her own with a devilish look in her eye saying you can call me anything you like but my name has gone to hide in all the time she laughs at those who shout her name and steal her clothes Veronica Veronica Thank you Thank you again for joining us on this podcast Thank you so much. And to all our listeners, thank you for joining us as well. And to Archstone Foundation, thank you for both supporting this podcast and all of the work that you've done around elder mistreatment, abuse, and neglect. Now you notice I'm just going to say all of those words together. Um, <laughs> just, just put them all in. So all of our listeners, I not want to get an email saying I missed a word Left on it. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.